Hi everyone, um, welcome. My name's James Curran and I work for the UK Civil Service and for people that don't know what that is, that is the government arm for the UK. So it could be covering work, pensions, trade, um, the NHS, so like national health, things like that. And my colleague Justin Cook, we're going to be going through how we use OpenStack and what the benefits that are that we saw from using OpenStack. And then towards the end of it, we'll give you a demonstration of our application that we've built on OpenStack as well. So um, in terms of a background, so the government's got a, a lot of different services. So we cover a wide spectrum of areas. It's not just looking at this small case study that we're going to show you in trade. We have a lot of areas such as um, it can go as far wide as national health. It can go over to Oops. It can go far through um, everything. So we've got plenty of things going on. Um, for this purpose of a case study, we're going to show you um, import and export licensing. So in terms of the UK, um, we were recognized as the most digitally advanced in the world. Um, and that was from last year in the United Nations e-government survey. Um, that covers a, a wide range of areas. So we do have a central area, which is called the Government Digital Service. And they have an overarching responsibility to look at departments and what type of work they're going to be doing. So um, one thing that's been created is something called the Digital Service Standard. And that gives an idea of how government should be developing services. So it covers areas, say, technology. So we have a, a specific idea on open source technology that we want as much of our services to be using open source. And it also goes as far as areas such as user research. So we want to make sure we understand what our people want that are using the service. And we have certain design principles. So for people that have seen any of the UK services, actually, we have a very bespoke um, design area. So you'll notice that all our services look similar. Um, and that gives a consistency for users so that they can understand how we're moving forward. One thing that we have got that's um, looking to push that agenda forward is the UK digital strategy. So here, we're not just looking at how we develop services, but also looking at how we can increase digital capability within the UK. So we're looking at how we can increase our broadband capability and how we can get people more access to services. Um, one thing that's been quite a problem for government is that we had a lot of siloed working over the past 20 or 30 years. We had government departments that were all doing the same thing that was very similar. But in fact, we wanted to develop it ourselves. We wanted to be the ones that were saying, look, we're doing great here, when we could be making a much better impact if we had cross-government services. And one of the things that OpenStack allows us to do is to support them cross-government services. So as we move into the case study, we'll be showing you how we're making our components reusable and how we're going to be looking at sharing our knowledge with other departments. Some of the examples that we've got that um, have been developed throughout government. Um, and these have not been using OpenStack, but as to give you a flavor of what we've been doing, is um, we're currently creating a single sign-on for exporters. So rather than um, our exporters having to log into loads of different services, they'll be able to log in with us once, and then we'll have mutual sign-on throughout the whole of all of our services. Um, and as a wider government policy, we also have three cross-government services. So we have something called gov.uk pay. So that enables us to take payments from citizens and they only have to log into one area. We have um, gov.uk notify. So that allows us to send emails, text messages as a cross-government solution. So we don't all have to build our own messaging components. And we also have gov.uk verify, which allows us to do a digital verification of um, some of our users. So they'll, we use partners such as Experian to go through and validate them through a digital capability. Um, so in terms of the case study, um, we're going to go through import and export licensing. So one thing that's important to note here is that it's an end-to-end -end digital transformation. So we're not just delivering a service. We're delivering a transformation to the business and pushing it forward. So rather than just having an IT service, we're actually looking at how we can deliver real benefits. Um, and part of that is also developing cross-government components. So in terms of import and export licensing, um, you actually would have to go to probably five or six departments if you were working in all type of goods that are licensed. So you can have military goods that are licensed. You can have arts and antiques that are licensed. You can have animals and plants that are licensed. And for us as a UK government, that is actually dealt with by different departments. So you'd be liaising with different people. Um, what we're looking to do here is actually 
develop reusable patterns and reusable components that we can then have them all going to one service for import and export licensing rather than having to go off and deal with different areas all the time. So if I give you a bit of background of our service, so we are at the moment focused on um, military and what we term um, dual use goods and these dual use are things that could be repurposed, um, so stuff like chemicals fall into that category and things like that. Um, ten years ago we had a completely manual process, they did it all on paper and they um, sent couriers around Westminster and sending all these papers over so that you could get wet signatures and everything could be signed off. Um, Eight years ago, we created our legacy system, which is called Spire. Um, so that is a replication of a manual process onto an IT system. So you'll find there's a lot of um, counter signatories. So you'll go through it and you're, loads of people are going to have to sign it off at the bottom because it just replicates exactly what they used to do for a manual process. Some of the positives for that are, though, that we've managed to get numerous departments using this. So when you come to make a decision on this type of licensing, we need to get Ministry of Defense and Foreign Office involved. So we've actually got multiple departments within government all using the same service. So it actually gave us a really good foundation to start building a new service and looking at how we can improve that. Um, so what, what are the goods that go through the system? So uh, military goods, they're quite obvious. So a tank a rifle, and um, they're, they're quite obvious, you know what a military good is. Um, dual use can be a bit more difficult, so it could be carbon fiber and bicycle tithers that could then go into a missile tip, so it's looking at different ways of how we could do that. So it's not just the UK that's responsible for this type of licensing, all countries do it, it comes down from uh, the World Trade Organization, um, and different countries do it in different ways. So we're looking to share as much as we can with other countries and understand the best way to do that. Um, but this is how we take the approach. Um, so if you go through what the problem with our current service is, um, we have a lot of confusing legislation. So our legislation is written by policy experts that aren't necessarily focused on the users. They're looking at how we can write the legislation and push that through. Um, some of the legislation isn't necessarily written by the UK either. It could come down from international laws or things like that. Um, so one of the key areas of our content designers is actually making our service usable. So when we do a demonstration later, I'll show you how we're rewording things to users so they can understand the different type of goods and pushing that forward. Um, our current service isn't particularly usable. So um, we've got some areas where it's really difficult to find what licenses we should be using. We have over 50 types of licenses that people could be using. So they're going through it and trying to understand how they fit into that and how they can export. When really these type of services should be encouraging exports and enabling people to export as well. So we're looking at how we can counteract that and make sure that the usability of the service is much better. Um, and because we're using legacy um, kit, it's actually expensive for us to maintain. So we're looking at how we can make cost savings and also push that forward. Um, unsurprisingly, a system that's 10 years old, it's, there's a lot of cost associated with hosting, with maintenance, and pushing that forward with upgrades. So we're looking at how we can continue to use other services like OpenStack to push that forward and hopefully drive our costs down. So what are we going to do in the near future? So, um, as I mentioned before, we do have some cross-government services. Um, say an exporter would realize and identify that they need to export. We then have a central hub called gov.uk where all of our services originate. So you, you would go into our gov.uk portal and you would look at how you want to, what activity that you want to do. Um, you will get a lot of guidance on that activity. And then we have another sub layer underneath that is when you'll get pushed to our services. So all of our services are on a domain called service.gov.uk. So it's all quite straightforward for a user to understand and where we're going. So in the near future, um, we're currently what I'm showing you is from the Department for International Trade, so looking at controlled goods. Um, but we're actually looking at how we can extend that out to other services, so Ministry of Defense, um, Department for Environment, and um, Arts Council. So that covers different types of licensable goods. We've got artwork, animals, plants, um, and they've all got a commonality. It's all a complex case management system. So it's looking at how we can reuse patterns and components to deliver an efficient service for the whole of government. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Justin, to talk around how we solved our problem using OpenStack. <clears throat> Great. So how did we solve the problem? <clears throat> These days, um, I guess I'll just go with the slides. <laughs> Right, so everything, the digital transformation is, um, <clears throat> the way we do business digitally is changing. It's basically permeating every aspect of our lives, right? 
you do something, you pick up your phone, if you forget your phone and leave it at home, it's going to be a bad day more than likely. And we need to collaborate across departments, which has already been said. All the silos, people using Ubuntu here, or Windows there, or RHEL here, CentOS, um, there's a smorgasbord of all sorts of technological choices. And if we converge the infrastructure pieces, we'll be able to save a lot of money. All this kind of makes sense, doesn't it? To build the environment, we need to evaluate a potential data center, right? Um, takes a lot of time to do that. Uh, what's the geographical location of that data center? What's the, are they tier three? Uh, they meet the requirements you need for uptime and <clears throat> the availability. Do I need to order kit and provision the cabinets in and send a team of people there, airfare, hotels, all that good stuff. Three to six months goes by and you may actually have uh, provisioned and racked and stacked cabinets where you can start installing the platforms. Right? <laughs> so it's not the way we do business anymore, obviously. <clears throat> with, technolo with technology like OpenStack in the cloud, um, all the patterns you use in infrastructure are undergoing significant transformation. They did this, what, seven or eight years ago? And now with containers, even it's even uh, transforming again. Um, a year ago, this was becoming fairly uh, heavily used, the container portion of it, but even accessing providers um, other than AWS or Azure, for instance, was fairly difficult to get uh, a good provider that could meet your requirements. Then you need a talent pool to uh, continue on and maintain that environment in the long run. In this case, we do have security classifications. Um, the data is classified, it has personal identifier, personal identifier information, is that right? Amongst other things, so you have issues with that. <clears throat> we need to align it with the government strategy as well. All this um, consolidation of infrastructure pieces uh, needs to be obviously reliable and deliver all the uh, performance that we need. But how do you do that, right? I mean, you really don't know. I mean, even for other providers, they may give you a baseline standard, um, but does it really meet that? We also need to have relationships, relationships with engineers um, because we do have issues. We don't just write websites and put it out there. We do some, you know, all three tiers of the stack. <clears throat> they need to be pragmatic. Um, a lot of the service, a lot of the managed services that are uh, provided today are either fairly expensive or, or they all add up. People just take advantage of all these managed services and you get, you know, a huge bill in the mail. And then the numbers don't lie when you do um, like tracing, syscalls, and things like that. IOPS, you can see the numbers, and again, it doesn't lie. Who do I pick up the phone call or a Slack message or something like that? These things really matter to us. And I've personally found that the larger providers get, sometimes it gets very difficult to get to the root of a problem and just make a uh, pragmatic result. I'm quoting myself. <clears throat> it's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we'll go on from that. <clears throat> and we create the estate. This is actually more yeah. your field. So um, one thing that we wanted to highlight is that the UK digital estate is actually quite a wide-ranging thing. So we have something called Digital Marketplace. So we encourage a lot of SME providers to register themselves on the digital marketplace. And that's where we have our authorized frameworks to be able to pick suppliers from. And there's quite a lot of suppliers. Um, so providing there's over 2,000 suppliers, and they provide about 26,000 services. So that's quite a big area. And G Cloud is only one of the sections of um, areas where we can procure services from. We also have um, areas for outcomes. So we can procure a specific outcome. We can say we want an alpha or a beta service. And we also can procure specialists as well. Um, and it also allows us to take advantage of pooling all of our government knowledge together, because we can then put the markets on there and get the rates that we're looking for. Um, so for our service, um, we use Red Hat OpenStack as infrastructure as a service, which is hosted by UK Cloud. Um, so these might be some companies that you've heard of that have previously been um, yesterday in different areas looking at um, what we're doing. And then we use Red Hat OpenShift for our microservices. 
And we're currently using a company called CoScale for monitoring and log aggregation. So we've got, um, certainly I've been walking around here and seen there's a lot of competition on monitoring and logging. So there's a lot of options and things that can be, can be used. But this is, um, for our current service, this is the choices that we made. Right, so you know, all the three or four months goes by, but in our case, uh, we you know, submit a ticket for an account and resources, how many CPUs, uh, storage, volumes, et cetera. And we get that assigned to us. We log into Horizon, and <clears throat> we then go to Access and Credentials, and we, get, we download our uh, credential file. We then source that file in our environment, and we can then run our Ansible playbooks, what we use. Uh, whatever you want, and then if you've done well, the estate is ready to go. It's really that easy. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so using the estate, um, after we've ran our Super Whammadyne Ansible playbooks, we now have a, a bare metal plat well platforms to us. So we've installed RHEL. We've installed the, um, we've configured the environments, the networks, the security groups, the volumes, all that good stuff. We have RHEL 7 platforms that are subscribed and ready to go. Um, we can create snapshots, do backups, whatever we want. I can even create an image from an existing platform and transfer that over to another project if I have other projects I want to use that or if I want to mirror it for whatever reason. <clears throat> And now we can do the things that um, we really should be doing, and that's, at this point in time, a lot of user research, solving the problems. The developers are actually working with them very closely, pretty much sitting right next to them, developing the um, application. We have private beta testers that are actually testing this and, and feeding back the information and monitoring and backups. All the infrastructure components that you used to have to worry about Absolutely, that's their problem. So in the end, what the business wants, we have successfully abstracted that um, using our idempotent uh, configuration management system. <clears throat> it's just repeatable. I can redeploy it in a moment's notice if I need to. And uh, monitoring so we can tell, you know, be proactive. We can see if there's going to be issues before <clears throat> those issues arise, before they become noticeable uh, by the user base. We should know about them beforehand. And then we can argue about whatever we want amongst the techies, right? So all the things that uh, we used to argue about are not our problem anymore. That's abstracted away and focus on the big things. Again, it's repeatable, maintainable, all infrastructure is code, and we can sit in front of the commons and confidently answer questions if we're actually put on the, on the spot in the box or in the chair. Um, and we've devolved each piece with precision, I like to think. <clears throat> so instead of having all the managed services, we can innovate ourselves uh, and do things exactly the way we want them, make things reusable that we can share across different organizations. It's all on GitHub. Um, you send a pull request if you want, uh, fork it, and life's good. We can also multi-tenant, so go back to converged infrastructure. Um, Hyper-convergence is the thing these days. We have other parts of the government departments that are interested in what we've built. They can multi-tenant with us. So we have a team that comes in, they need to develop X, whatever the app does, how many resources do they need? If they're using the microservices patterns, then we give them a, uh, a project account and our open shift. And then the, even at that point, our, our guests become abstracted away to them. So it's just a matter of do we have the compute resources available as a whole? <clears throat> we could also um, go to multiple hosting providers if need be, which is, you know, that's a good thing. Um, be redundant across suppliers, put it in AWS if we wanted to, other open stack carriers, which that's a good thing. I mean, literally just give me a different uh, API endpoint and boom, it's up and running. <clears throat> and once again, build reusable microservices across the organizations, which is, um, that seems to be the latest and greatest thing that's caught hold in the market. <clears throat> so 
So keep it simple, stupid, obviously KISS, that's the acronym I've always known it as. Um, we keep it simple and we win every time. Uh, we don't have to worry about, I mean, for instance, if I do something 10 years ago that I thought was incredibly clever and six months goes by and I'm like, oh my God, what does that do? What was I thinking? And then I have to go back and try and figure out what I thought was clever at the time. So when you think you're being really clever, sometimes you're just kicking yourself. Cool. So um, we've, we've told you a lot of stuff. Um, so what we're going to help now is visualize what our service actually looks like. So what we've actually built onto OpenStack. So while we just get the video up. Actually, how do we turn this off? <laughs> Exit. Cool. Um, right, so this is our service, the front end, is finding out if you need an import and export license. Um, one thing that we have been looking for is we, um, government's particularly concerned with are people able to use the internet, are they able to use digital services? We do a lot of testing with what we term assisted digital users, so these are people that might find it difficult to use the internet. We also have people that um, due to like age barriers and different barriers, um, why they can't use a service. So we started doing a lot of testing with our service, and we found out that, in fact, a lot of people find it difficult to get through the end-to-end -end service. It's quite a long process to work out if you need an import or an export license. So we created a, a save and continue functionality. So this is before our account registration happens. If someone wants to leave our service, we'll pull them straight back into the service from there. So um, you have the option to email this code. Um, and for the purpose of this demo, we send it to a test account. So um, that's all important because it helps people have the confidence they can get through the service. Um, what we then look at is trying to work out where our items are going. And you might think that this looks like a really straightforward screen. So we've got things around an export or an import. But our user research was showing us that people didn't necessarily know what an export or an import was. Um, we had some examples of people thinking they were importing shotguns into New Zealand when in fact they were exporting it from the UK. So they were going down the complete wrong user journey. So we have to actually tell people now, are you going out of the UK, are you coming in, or are you facilitating shipments? So it kind of gives them a good overview of um, what they're looking at. So this screen here is to help navigate our gov.uk content. Um, so you can see all the different types of goods. So around gov.uk, we have numerous guidance pages where people can then find what they need to do. So for this journey, where we're looking at military goods, you would go down into our service. But if you were to go to animals or plants or arts, we'll actually direct people to the right gov.uk area so it finds it a lot easier to find what they need. And hopefully moving forward, we'll be able to digitize all of them systems so that we can have it all in one place and people can have a generic account where they can export and import. So once they expand an area, they get an overview of what it is. And then they'll be moving into what type is your goods. So even though they've told us it's a military good, we then need to try and work out, well, what type of military good is it? So it could be a physical good. It could be software. It could be technical information. All of these are what we term controlled. So we need to work out, well, what is it? So at this point, once they've done that, so this one here is going down the physical goods journey. Um, so in terms of what they do, they then need to describe their item. So it's a free text box. Um, we have had numerous iterations of the screen. So we did have loads of categories going down saying, can you give us a lot of information about this? We found out that our user base, are, a lot of them are actually quite expert at what they do. So they end up putting almost the technical specification into these boxes. So what we actually want them to do is give us a brief overview of what their, their good is. So at this point, it gives them opportunity to type this in. So what's going to happen here is um, we use something called Elasticsearch. So it's going to go back and go into our database and try and rate the good. Um, so in terms of what I mean by a rating, um, you have a type of good, and it needs to be rated against a, something called a control list. And that's about a 300-page document that has a lot of codes. So it could go down the route of um, a rifle is military list one, but military list can go down into the hundreds. So it's kind of looking how you rate it in a terminology as well. So here we go, it's going to search for a shotgun, and it's going to come back with possible matches. So at this point, these possible matches we've converted into plain English. So they're 
actually a lot more lengthy than that. So it's trying to work out how we can make it more presentable to people. So if you just go down this route, um, it then shows what type are available. So we're looking here, and you've, you've come to this, and you're reading about your firearm. Um, it's, well, is your item listed above? Is it, if it is, then you've actually got the wrong controller. So as you can probably see, it's quite a complex area in order to try and rate your goods. So we're trying to get a journey where people can go through. And this is the first time that we introduce them to the concept of what this military list is. So our expert users know lots about this, this list, and they almost can recite it in terms of what they're doing. Um, but here we're trying to introduce the concept. So we're giving almost like a breadcrumb trail to understand exactly what it is. And you might have noticed now that the more, uh, the more technical specifications are coming out. So previously we said it was a, a smoothbore weapon. But in fact, this list here it needs to be a certain millimeter. Um, but presenting that someone as a first time user is actually quite intimidating for an exporter. It's, well, um, it's very detailed in terms of what they want to do. Although if you felt that you've gone down the wrong route, and you can't describe your items, you can go back into the search. So we have a lot of um, ways that you can go back into the service. So you can add more detail. So if you put rifle after it, you can then go in and go down the re correct route. So you'll find what you're looking for. Um, so in this case, going down the ammunition route. And then again, these screens are actually quite important for our service because it's enabling us to understand what they're doing. So it's kind of looking to say, well, can we identify what it isn't? And then we'll keep pushing forward until we find the right rating. Um, Say, so if the load isn't, then we come down to military list three. So there, was, there wasn't much difference between what this person was wanting, but there's a difference between one and three. So that's quite a simple example. And if you were to read through the document, you would have seen that quite quickly. But we do have issues of it is a very large document, and it could be on the rating that they're reading could be on page five, but the rating that they need is actually on page 210. So it's kind of like, depending on what they're looking for, it's not the best organized. So um, if this does describe their items, um, we can then go through the final destination. So what we're looking at is where are these goods going to? Um, one really cool thing that we're currently looking at in government is how we use registers. So we're looking to create a country register. So we're inputting that into a, a cross-government service of does the UK have a common list of what countries we can use and export to? So this will be feeding into a register. At the moment, it's just using our previous data. But say, for the purpose of this demo, we're going to send it to the United States. Um, and what we're now looking at is we're interested in, is it going anywhere first? Because that may impact our decision from a business point of view is if it's going through another country. So you have the option to type in France. So it's just going through a European country. What we're doing here now is, I mentioned earlier that we have a lot of license types. So what we're doing here is trying to filter them down so we can present them with the most usable license that's coming through. Unfortunately, um, if you were to use our legacy system, it would come up with, we have roughly two types of licenses. We have an open license that's got preset terms and conditions, and we have a standard license that um, then needs to be assessed by a government department. Unfortunately, within the open licenses, we have about 55 of them, and within the standard licenses, we've got about 20. So it's a considerable amount of license that you could use. So we're using this screen here to start filtering down, saying, well, which ones are applicable and which ones could you use? So if you were to say no to all of these questions, it would then come back with the licenses that are possible that you could use. So another interesting thing to point out here is that these licenses are quite lengthy themselves. So if you were to read them straight away, they're at, some of them are close to 18 pages long to understand if you could use this license. You can probably imagine for an exporter that's not the best thing that they want to be doing. They want to work out if they can use this license. So the first thing we're doing is filtering any questions out. So if any of these apply, you can't actually use this license. Then what we're doing is creating summaries for them. So instead of having the 18 pages to read through, you can now go through what you can do, what you can't do, and what you must do with the license. So that we're really encouraging trade here so that people can start using it. Unfortunately, we're still having to go out to other services. So um, we're looking at providing information on if they need to know what the EU directive is. Unfortunately, that's still quite lengthy. But it's the option there that they can go through the hyperlink and understand what they want to do. Um, if you feel that that isn't applicable for you, you can go back and you can go back to our search screen and pick a different license type. Again, we'll filter this out. So we'll be saying, well, what, if any of this applies, you can't actually use this license. But we're, we're helping them to understand what it means to use these licenses rather than just saying, go away and read it. Um, at this point, you can then 
register for the license. So you'll notice that our save and continue code is there. So you'd have noticed in the top right hand corner that it's been there all the time. So it allows people, if they want to go out the service, they can go out and come back with a save and continue code. Um, we're reminding them again, because at this point we're going through our account registration process. So now they're, they're moving into our service and we'll be registering them as a, a company or an individual, depending on what they're doing. We can have individuals who are going to the Olympics and they, they're shooting exercises, so it's, it's quite a diverse user base in terms of what they want to do. So you have the option to change as well, so you can go back into our service and you can say, well, actually, it's not going through France, um, I, can, I can take that out. And then that will affect the licenses that could be available as well. So we'd take them back into the journey and identify different types of licenses that they could use. But it might actually be that the license they had before actually works because a lot of these licenses are applicable to numerous destinations. So one of the things that we want to do is start to increase trade and say, you've got a license to the United States, do you know it's also applicable to go to Australia or somewhere like that? So it starts opening up different markets. So in terms of license registration, um, we've created a, a SAML interface with our Spire system. So Spire is our legacy system. If you have an account on Spire, you can log straight into our service. So we use, almost use it as an early single sign-on mechanism that we're developing with uh, Department for International Trade's wider services. Um, so at this point, um, you would then go into our service. Um, sorry. So you would go into our service for an account registration. And if you don't have an account on our legacy system, we'll then create you one. And we've created APIs between the two services. So our development team's currently working on a dashboard so that the exporters will get to use our nice new system and we'll be able to have API communication between the two services. Um, whereas the case processing element, which is actually quite lengthy and quite big, that will all be processed on a legacy system while we start to replace that. So that's helped you to visualize our service and understand what it actually looks like. Um, and now it's time for any questions. So if anybody's got any questions, then please. Yes, oh, sorry, over in the corner. Yeah. So we get different types of feedback, as you can imagine. So um, it's the prim primary function is for user research so that people can start telling us is that the correct thing? Uh, we want to understand how our database is working as well. It's quite difficult to rate your goods, so we want the feedback in terms of I typed in this type of good, but actually the control code back came wrong, or um, it's understand how we can improve that and tweak our algorithms within there. Um, we do get some technical feedback as well, so in terms of um, some of our, the main technical feedback that we get is through our monitoring and logging, but in fact, we do have people making comments and things around that, so it's actually quite useful, and it's an, it's an open forum that, works really well for government services because people don't feel like they're, they're being pressured by government to do anything. It's kind of like a, there you go, there's an option if you want to do feedback. Cool. Any others? Yes. Are you just using it as a stack of the IAS device? Yes, well, Justin. <laughs> yes, <clears throat> we're using it just as uh, infrastructure as a service. Right. And we do all our own services internally, like IPA server for Kerberos, LDAP, um, in internal names or internal DNS, et cetera. Cool. Yes, at the back. Um, so we've had some cost projections. Um, we won't know until we have completely implemented it, but it's looking around the 50% the mark in terms of our hosting. Um, we will obviously know as we implement more, but the way that the previous service was built was that it replicated a manual process. So about 10 years ago, there wasn't much user research into what the service should be. It was like, this is how we're gonna deliver a service. Through our user research, we might find out that we need to build other services that actually makes the whole service bigger. So our hosting costs might not be as a big reduction, but if we were to do a, a complete replication, then yeah, that's the sort of figure, but it depends on what other services we need to build on the back of our user research. Yes? I have a question uh, regarding monitoring and maintenance of the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, do you use something like machine learning for failure prediction of hardware, software, services, and anything like this? Justin? The company uses CoScale, and they do have that um, capability built in. Not, I don't know if it's machine learning. I wouldn't call it that. But they do forward looking. Like, for instance, if you're a trivial example, would be if um, a directory is filling up 
at a, at a pace faster than intended, and I will get an alert beforehand, uh, and I can deal with it before I, you know, the alert actually really happens. But not really what you're asking, I believe. Okay, so you mentioned that you had, uh, you got cooperation among different organizations for this, so I'm mm -hmm. guessing it's the different organizations that control each of uh, the specific fields, yep. like you're saying military goods mm -hmm. versus uh, some of the other fields. Um, did What were the sort of challenges faced with convincing them that this is the way that they're going to do it, this centralized means of doing this, and is that going to, uh, the successes that you had in that area, will that encourage other cross Yes, so the, um, the main challenge is how we, um, how we share it. So there's different ways that we could do it. We could say, um, we'll build it on your behalf to the other department, and you tell us what type of stuff you want. Or we could share design patterns and design libraries and then share it through that way. So it's actually quite difficult in terms of what does the department want. So if you take, for example, um, the, the arts and antiques, they actually have a completely manual process at the moment, and they would love for us to implement something that's an online service. Um, so that's quite an easy one. It would be like, well, actually, we'll probably build it for you. Um, but there's a different approach for the animals and plants. So animals and plants, they've got a semi-automated system, but they want to take advantage of um, some of the stuff that we've been building, because the case processing flow is actually pretty similar. Like, it's make an application, some people have a look at it, and then we'll make a decision if we'll issue it or not. Um, but, but they'll want to reuse some of their stuff and some of our stuff. So it's like, how do we actually share our knowledge? And it's not always one way to do it. There's different ways of doing it. So I hope that answers the question. But we've had like different ways of do it sharing. It's proving quite difficult at the moment. Cool. Any final questions? Um, so, at the moment, um, the, the back end stuff, so if you're, say, are you more interested in the infrastructure back end or what we would term our case processing, so where the government employees would be making a decision? Okay. Yeah, so in terms of a standard, so assessing like UK government services, um, we have something called the Digital Service Standard, and that's got 18 points that cover a wide range of things. So some of it will cover the technology side, but it also covers our user research practices, our design practices, analytics, and how we do things. And um, at different stages of development, you have to go through assessments by something called the Government Digital Service, and they are part of the Cabinet Office, which is one of our like overarching departments. And each stage, say, for alpha, beta, and live, you'll go through an assessment against that criteria, and that's where some of these things would come up, saying, well, how do we share our information, and what do we do? And this design template that you can see in front of you here is a standard template for all government services. So all of our government services look like this, so it's to give a, a consistent feel for all government services. Cool. Well, if there's no more final questions, um, thank you for everyone coming along, and um, please, please get in contact if you'd like to know anything more. <coughs> I will finish by. <laughs>